everybody. Just a couple of pre-show updates, notes, whatever you want to call them. Um, it looks like we're still having some tech issues since I've got my computer back from the shop. So um, in today's show, Sean couldn't hear any of the intro music or the sounds or the different um, soundboard stuff today um, in our first segments. We tried to fix it at the first break, and um, then my mic uh, seemed to um, barely register um, on the recording, even though it was showing up on our levels. So it's a little bit of a rocky part two and part three today. Uh, I apologize for this. But uh, hopefully we're going to be able to get this fixed. Looks like it's a driver issue. But um, just wanted to give you a heads up before you launch full in. Um, the first segment is, um, is is pretty decent. There's a couple places where Sean is talking over the, the sound. Um, but the second segment and the last segment, I've had to do a bunch of adjustments. And um, I'm disappointed, I have to say. But anyways, I'll leave you with this. Um, thanks, everybody, for all your patience and all your support. Um, you know, man, this is the kind of thing I wish I could do full-time because uh, um, this kind of stuff wouldn't happen. But, you know, this is the state of the the world and the state of how we do things. So um, hope you enjoy the show. Talk to you soon. Bye. weird was that briefing really weird it was almost an out-of-body experience for me i was floating above myself looking down saying you're sitting here briefing the incoming president of the united states about prostitutes in moscow sorry i'm not paying attention I'm supposed to do something here. <laughs> oh it is friday 420 that's right 420 folks and not only is it 420 Right, um, but just moments ago, or a shortly time ago, we also had the the National Walkout Day begin as students across the country begun walking out. <clears throat> pretty incredible, pretty incredible. Welcome to Raging Chicken's Out to Coop podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Silly Face Kitchen, <laughs> about the good, <laughs> the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. And this week's show, Comey, Comey, Comey. Yeah, that's how you sell them books. That's right. That was some weird shit, all right? <laughs> Just like you said. All eyes now on Michael Cohen. The speculation grows that he will flip on Trump. And a former Trump divorce lawyer goes to CNN to say that Cohen's fear of prison rape will push him to flip. I guess this is what we do on the news now, folks. This is what we do on the news. Those speculations come on the heels of the big Hannity factor reveal as part of a Monday court order demanding the release of Michael Cohen's third client. That's right, he's got three clients, two of which received payouts to women because they wanted to cover up sexual improprieties. Not saying that's what's going on with Sean Hannity, I'm just saying. And Rudy's back! Rudy! Rudy! On Thursday, Trump tapped his pal, Rudy Giuliani, for his legal team. And after every other lawyer with half a brain gave Trump the cold shoulder. And Giuliani pledges to end the Mueller investigation in a couple of weeks. So strap in, everybody. Teachers continue to upend the poisoned apple cart. Yesterday, Arizona teachers voted to walk out of school beginning at April 26th. That's Arizona, folks. Teachers rejected a carrot of 20% pay raises, demanding instead significant increases to school funding. Colorado teachers staged a huge rally in the state capitol on Monday, and teachers in the two largest school districts, Denver and Jeffco, plan on back-to-back walkouts on April 26th and 27th. And they'll be walking out for major rallies once again at the state capitol, and they will be rallying for increased school funding. At this point, it's not known how many other school districts will also join in the walkouts. And after Kentucky's Governor Matt Bevin told the world that he guaranteed that students were sexually assaulted, physically harmed, ingested poison, and or were introduced to drugs for the first time because of the student walkout, he says, sorry, not sorry. Teachers and state Democrats reject the non-apology. According to a new article in the journal Nature, the Atlantic Ocean circulation has slowed down. It hasn't been this sluggish in over a thousand years. Think Ice Age, people. The Atlantic... uh, I'm going to try to get this right. The Atlantic uh, Meridional 
overturning circulation, which brings warm water to Europe and is largely responsible for Europe's more temperate weather, is slowed by is slowing significantly by the melting of fresh water from glaciers in Greenland and elsewhere. And now, just a heads up, everybody, would be the perfect time to read Kim Stanley Robinson's Science in the Capital series. That trilogy plays out what would happen if the AMOC stops. Spoiler, it's not good. On the other side of the climate ledger, New York City votes to divest city funds from fossil fuels. That's freaking huge. It's going to withdraw any money for um, city pensions and other investments. Boom, taking that out from the fossil fuel industry. New York in the lead again. This week, the Brennan Center also um, released a report that shows that bills expanding voting rights now outnumber those seeking to restrict voting rights. The report came out as New Jersey voted to enact automatic voter registration in the state. The new law will uh, will now register voters as part of a motor voter registration. And Kansas Secretary of State Chris the Asshole Kobach was held in contempt of court this week after he failed to follow through on the court's order to notify thousands of Kansans that they were eligible to vote in 2016. Kobach was, of course, the face of Trump's Voter Fraud Commission. In other words, the commission to commit voter fraud on the rest of us. Sweet justice, sweet justice. Democratic billionaire Tom Steyer, 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 is barnstorming around the country funding impeachment ads and progressive candidate forums. Steyer's Next Gen America hosted the first town hall in the PA 7th. And good old Morgan Ellie was the only Democratic candidate not to raise his hand when asked if candidates support abortion rights. And today is, as I said at the top, National Walkout Day. Students for greater gun control are walking out again across the nation on the 19th anniversary of the Columbine Massacre. PA House passes bill banning aborting fetuses with Down syndrome. Here we go again. And Charlie Dent, the reasonable Republican, announces early retirement. That will necessitate a special election before November under the old congressional lines. <laughs> Here we go. Wait, did Daryl Metcalf actually threaten Chris Robb with a gun? Some kind of state street capital duel? We'll get more information on that. Huge anti-gerrymandering rallies in the PA Capitol this week. Activists packed the Capitol Rotunda on Monday, and crowds were as high as the fourth floor. Sean Kitchen was there to take part in history. And Sean cracks into the establishment and begins writing for Third in State, a PA Budget and Policy Center blog. His first piece, The Trump Tax Bill Wasn't For You, was published on Tuesday. He is required to include hashtag resistance on all of his posts, by the way. Just kidding. (laughs) We'll have Sean walk us through that, and big congrats to Sean. And today's last call, Space News is back. Much to the uh, demise of, or the dismay of Sean. He'll get through it, though, because it's 420. (laughs) NASA and SpaceX launched tests this week, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite. That's going to be looking at, as you guessed it, exoplanets. Um, Pretty cool stuff, actually. Next month, NASA will launch a new Mars rover, InSight, which will be the first ever interplanetary West Coast launch, and that's going to measure seismic activity in the West. Uh, My daughter's very disappointed about the fact that, you know, they're doing all these uh, events up and down the coast of California, um, family-friendly events, really cool stuff. And she's like, I want to go. Why aren't they coming to Philadelphia? That's what she told me last night. And we got billionaire Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross announces more details Tuesday about how his department will become a one-stop shop for regulating the burgeoning space industry. He says that space already is already a $300 billion business and expects it to balloon to $1 trillion quickly. He says that moon, the moon will now be a gas station for Mars. Not my words, man. And Mike Pence says that U.S. is getting serious about space junk. NASA finally got an administrator in Bridenstine. He barely advanced this week. We'll get into that. And question remains, though, about his use of as a nonprofit to benefit himself. And Sean winds up his stint at Pizza Boy. We'll take a few moments to remember the good times. 
want to remind everybody to tune into the Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. I'll be there giving the weekly resistance report. You can stream the show live at freespeech.org. You can also tune in on the Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. If you missed the show, no problem. Just go to Free Speech TV or freespeech.org and look for the Rick Smith Show in the show archives. If you like what you hear, you like to support what we do, support Pull No Punches Progressive Media by becoming a member of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash rcpress, choose your membership level. If you're not ready to become a member, no problem. You can make a one-time donation by going to ragingchickenpress.org and click on the support and membership tab. Click donate and you're good to go. Otherwise, just become a member, folks. We need you. Patreon.com slash rcpress. Sean, man, happy 420. Thank you. How's it going? Good, good. I, you know, um, I, I, you know, I know it's uh, it's always a toss up for you. Uh, what's going to be your favorite holiday? Is it going to be Festivus or is it going to be 420? Uh, I'm just saying. So at least uh, one of the two top ones for you. So you know who's having a really good 420 this morning? Uh, do tell. Uh, Daryl Metcalf is having a Darryl. Really good one. Wait, Daryl Metcalf? He's having a good one. Yes, I think I think we should start off the show by just reading this. Oh, that, that, wait, you know, we got to we just... Uh, what do you want to wait? No, no, no. I, th- I think that I think it's a kind of a good idea. But we have to, if we're going to do it, though, we got to do this first. Daryl Metcalf. All right, let's hear what he's got to say. Another lying Philadelphia liberal Democrat legislator attacking me this week with the help of, of the media. Another Democrat playing the victim while he's actually the perpetrator, exclamation point. After committee meeting last week, Philadelphia Representative Rab approached me and launched into a profanity-laced, uh, disrespectful tirade. A week later, he wrote a letter making false accusations that threatened him and uh, based it on me possibly being armed because of my support for the Second Amendment! Exclamation <laughs> point. There is a pattern to the attacks that have been made against me by liberal loser Democrat legislators on my committee. <laughs> oh, man, I got to tell you. Uh, former uh, Representative Leslie Acosta, who lied about me as a convict Acosta, lying homosexual rep Ryan Sims has been under his, an ethics investigation. Then there is the constant touchy-feely rep representative Matt Bradford, who touched me over 40 times in what many offers ever say is a way to tempt me to provoke me. And they oppose. <clears throat> so, yeah, that, that's basically the uh, we went Stop off, touching off, me. Off, off today. Remember this one, Sean? Chairman, you're yelling at a lady. I wish you would. Hurt. Representative Bradford, I'm, I'm not yelling at anybody. I'm telling you. You're so out it feels order. like uh, Representative Metcalf's um, fear of being touched and being uh, is keeping him up at night, and he had to go uh, start his day off like this. All I'm saying is like, uh, and that was from his Twitter account this morning? <laughs> Facebook page. Facebook yes. page. All I'm saying is like, Daryl didn't have his edibles this morning. That's for sure. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you don't smoke weed. You wake Dude, up like this. Little and... grumpy Daryl, man. Grumpy yeah. Daryl. Grumpy Daryl. Grumpy Daryl. Starting off the bed. Starting off the weekend. Oh my God! Tell me about it. Um, but man, it's been it's been a it's been a crazy week. I, I have to say, I'm so psyched to actually be back on Friday from like my little studio here, kind of doing this because the last two weeks have been just like like cramming together something to kind of get out, kind of on the road and all that stuff. For thanks everybody for kind of. Uh, putting up with it um but it kind of feels good to be back in the seat um um, but i'll try not to uh, make my my uh my happiness of being back here um turn into a three-hour show um i especially know that (laughs) sean will not tolerate that on this on this on this day because he wants to be outside in the sunshine by the water um for the walkouts i mean i mean for something else um but so I mean, Sean. I mean, I mean, this this week has been has been nuts, man. I mean, uh, I mean, I, you start with Comey, right, coming out with this book, and like you know, I played the, in the intro today, like his that first interview. Did you watch the the interview with Stephanopoulos? No, I did not. Well, it was just like it was just surreal, and apparently there's like the 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 total interview was five hours long, right, and the the actual the excerpts were about an hour long, but the whole transcript has been released. It's just like I'm telling you, it's something out of like, it, it's just so surreal. I mean, I just can't believe we're actually talking about this stuff. And then, of course, you've got the whole, you know, you know, uh, you got the Comey book coming out, and that's you know he's doing his interviews all over the place. And then you got the same thing going on. You've got kind of some kind of liberals uh, like 
impossible. It's impossible to fit into their brains that um, you can have someone who's actually saying things that are kind of important for this investigation. Um, but they could also be, you know, not perfect, you know, characters. You know, doesn't everything has to be divided into heroes and villains, right? So now Comey is now being like, you know, lifted up as like, oh, you know, he's our leader. He's our leader. Please leader run on the, the Democratic state. ticket. What's the, that? Uh, that the the resistance Democrats love their FBI agents and they do, they do. The only thing that uh, I think the only thing that um, is lacking in uh, Comey's uh, qualifications to become like the resistant Democrat uh, kind of leader is the uh, is the fact that he did not serve as a CIA special ops agent because <laughs> that, that would definitely put him over the top and they, they would be out of the run for president. Speed. Yeah. But it was, you know, it's actually, I, I have actually watched the interviews, and the interviews are actually kind of interesting. A lot of it's stuff that's already been reported and stuff, um, but uh, it, it's just fascinating. Um, and then so you got the Comey book come out, and then, of course, right on the heels of that, of course, there's like, you know, Cohen chaos um, after the court appearances on, on Monday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Of uh, all people who would have thought that uh, Sean Hannity – would be the one who uh, is Cohen's third unnamed uh, client. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, it's just crazy. I mean, it's just like, like when I, I thought like I didn't realize he only had three clients, and the other person who got outed, um, you know, was fixing a uh, was fixing a sex scandal where he supposedly want this uh, mistress who was happened to be like a Playboy bunny or something, yeah, uh, to get an abortion if she was pregnant. We don't know they, they don't know if she was pregnant or not, but got Cohen to get one point six million dollars. And then, uh, yeah, Sean Hattie was the third candidate or the third third client. Well, as I was looking at that, I mean, when that came out, it's like you could imagine everyone. And like all reports are, I was like, people were just like, what, 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 what? <laughs> There's a big collective gasp in the courtroom. Yeah. once it like, I mean, it was really funny, like listening to uh, Stormy Daniels' lawyer uh, talk about how they allowed, how the lawyer just gave them up. Like, well, yeah. like the lawyer, like they, they, they had this back and forth rambling going on, but then like the lawyer is like, um, can I say it or write it down? It's like, yeah, whatever. And he's like, Sean Hannity. Well, it, look, it was interesting and- because the back and forth, like, like, um, Rachel Maddow, like on I, either Monday night or Tuesday, I, don't, I think it was probably, probably Monday night. She read through the back and forth, right. Of the transcript. And it was like exactly like that. And so look, if you go back and look at it, it looks like what Cohen's lawyers were trying to figure out was like, is Cohen going to be disbarred if he gives up the name, right? Um, but as soon as as soon as soon it was clear that, like, no, his ethics are protect, protected, they're like, they're, they, they were looking to kind of spit it out of them. Like, they wanted to get as far away from as possible. And, you know, and I mean, everyone, if you, were, if you had a pool going on who the third client was going to be, Right, I'm sure there's like you know all these different political players going on, and like who can like, oh, no be Sean Hannity? Yeah, and they say Sean Hannity, and at one point like they're like what what what, and then everyone's like grabbing their head, going, "Of course it's Sean Hannity," because it would be too normal <laughs> if it was like another politician or Republican donor. Of course, it's got to be Sean Hannity, right? Oh yeah, I mean like the, <laughs> I, 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 that, that, that's just like okay, I'm not surprised about this, but it's pretty fucking crazy at the same time. <laughs> It's just like, nuts. Like, like, I mean, of course, like, yeah, of course it would be Sean Hannity. And like the way people were reacting, like, um, like the, the supposedly the courtroom had a collective gas, yeah, like, yeah. like someone like had a heart attack or something. Yep. Like all the air just got sucked out of the room at once. Well, it was fascinating. You know, I mean, and again, the, the, back in the order. Well, and the key thing was uh, there was really interesting in terms of that, that transcript is because the um, initially the judge was ready to um, let. Uh, Cohen's lawyer give the um, uh, put Hannity's name in a sealed envelope and keep it under seal. And it was only because there was a lawyer there for the press, right? Who he's about to do this. The, the judge is kind of like, yeah, okay. If you put it into a thing and that the lawyer's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What's the legal grounds for this? And the judge is like, you know, you better you better come and approach me. And the lawyer's like, "Hey, yeah, look, I'm the lawyer for the New York Times, uh, ABC News, and a whole bunch of other things. And what is the legal rounds to keeping this, um, to, you know, uh, to keeping this under seal? Um, if you're going to release the name, it should be released to everybody. There's a right to know. And there's an the interest, in it. and the judge is kind of like, 
yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, kind of. And she was like, you know, no, it looks a compelling argument. So it, it was a real question of had not that lawyer been there advocating for um, for uh, um, open access for the press uh, that might actually have been under seal. And now we could have all sorts of questions about like how relevant, how important is it that we know that this is Sean Hannity, right? I mean, I, I'm more interested in the fact that you had Sean Hannity as a reporting on this case, right, and kind of being an advocate for this case at the same time behind the scenes, right? He's kind of working with this with this legal team. That for me is kind of the more interesting part of it. I could care less if he's got a sex scandal going on, right? Um, but you know, it'd be surprising does if he doesn't really have ethics. Well, that's what I mean. I mean, would it really I mean, surprise you? <laughs> I mean, we're like, man, this really goes after Sean and Hattie's ethics. What ethics? He never had any I, I ethics know it's to like, begin with. I, I hear people saying, oh, man, it goes right to the core of his... I'm like, who would... I mean, ethics who... Who's blaming his vocabulary? No, exactly. I mean, so, like, uh, what does it actually reveal? I think it was more... It was more of the... I mean, that gasp, I think, had to be more of the kind of, like... Like I was saying before, kind of like, of is course it's someone like Sean Hattie. Like, because it's not insane enough as it is. Yeah, it, it can't get more crazy. Oh, no, right. And then exactly. like Sean Hannity comes out, you're just like, wow, it's like it's like it's like the comment section of the internet. Anything totally. and everything is possible right now at this moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was saying to uh you know, I was having this conversation with uh with some colleagues the other day, and they're like, you know, I just I'm trying to they're like I'm trying to sort out they're being kind of very, you know, serious about it, I'm trying to sort out kind of you know, what's what's actually real and what's and what's and what's like just completely fabricated and crazy and fake. I'm like, look. You, 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 your problem is that, you know, I didn't say your problem. I said, but the issue is they're the same thing now. There is no line, right? I said, once you get past that, then you can move on, right? You're spending all trying to sort out like fact from fiction. I mean, okay, yeah, there, there's some importance to that, but don't let it get you down, man, because I, we're, we're in that world. We're like two feet jump, jumped right in. Yeah. So, and you know, speaking of which, and then so the follow up to this, right? So, what do you get to the you know the the other bookend of the week? Then is Rudy Giuliani last night gets brought on in Trump's legal team, and he says, uh, "Yeah, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna negotiate the end of the uh, you know the end of the uh, Mueller investigation within two weeks." Right, and that guy had a shitting grin on his face, like so big, right? You know, his dentured shitting grin, like so big, right? That he was so happy to be brought on to be kind of somewhat relevant again in the world of politics. Um, but you know, again, this is kind of like you know, you know, again, the you know, this is where Comey was right. I mean, total like mob boss mentality, you know, which we've been saying for you know, God, since what, 2016. Um, that's what's going on. It's just people utter loyalty kind of coming in, and you're just going to do the hack job that they're going to do. It's going to be a, it's going to be crazy, man. Yeah. So whatever. But in the meantime, in actually real politics, right, man, um, the the teachers, the teachers walkouts this week have been absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, following what started in West Virginia is now, you know, you got Arizona teachers basically rejecting a 20 percent pay raise and saying, you know what? First of all, number one, uh, it's a it's, it was a um, it was like a like a time release pay raise right so they get nine percent in the first year and would move on from there it wasn't until like down the road a little bit they hit the 20 percent but they looked at it and they're like you know what one there's really no guarantee this is going to go through and number two that's only part of the issue the real part of the issue is, is that we you know we don't have enough funding in our schools and so they said nope forget that so on april 26 we're going to have um they're they're planning on, on a statewide walkout of arizona teachers it's incredible yeah and then to the same day you're gonna have a two-day walkout uh in denver colorado you know, in Denver and uh, Jefferson County, it looks like the two largest counties and are going to have their own walkouts and rally at the state capitol. I mean, I really think this is a um, I think this is a culmination of things, uh, the teachers movements that we're seeing right now, years of teacher blaming and the right wing's constant attack on teachers. And now, like, you know, they are showing unions how they should act in this age, That's especially right. with Janice coming up. I mean, teachers are one of the more radical unions that have been out there now over the past 10 years. No, absolutely. You know, and it's, you know, and again, uh, I was, I've been trying to make a similar argument among kind of uh, my kind of fellow faculty members. I mean, again, these teachers who are standing up and walking out, let's be clear. These are teachers. These are K through 12 teachers, right? Public school teachers across, uh, across going out. Um, and I'm only, I'm, I could only hope that we're going to see um, the same kind of uh, activism happening among kind of higher education faculty. Of course, it's happening more on the adjunct level of things, but I'm telling you, it's like um, there is still such a degree of, um, of, 
I, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, I don't know what, um, of unwillingness or, or or fear or whatever it might be for um, not kind of you know, going full throttle at the higher ed level. So, I mean, I look at what's going on in, in Colorado. I mean, I remember I was at the Abscoff Legislative Assembly last week, as, as people know. And uh, we are, took this we had took this big photo, solidarity photo, right, for the um, um, for God, what was it? The the was it the strike? Uh, yeah, it was like, was it West Virginia? No, was it West Virginia? I don't remember. We didn't take a solidarity. What, what got settled last? I see, I'm, everything's blurring together now for me. It got settled. The strike that got settled on Thursday or Friday morning, right? Kentucky? That might have been the Kentucky, but then they rejected it, right? So, I mean, kind of initially had taken up um, that. Well, whatever. No, no. We took, we took a Kentucky one and put it out. But anyways, the point being is that um, that's clearly where, where the center of gravity is um, in terms of like the kind of movements that we got to, got to be working on. Um, and, you know, and anybody, you know, in, in education for that matter, who does not follow in their footsteps does so at their own, um, you know, at their own demise, but man, it, uh, unbelievable, unbelievable stuff. Yeah. But, you know, and the fact is we talked about this before, but, you know, um, the fact that we see this happening in Colorado in Arizona and Kentucky, some of the areas um, that, you know, exactly what you were saying, Sean, that um, some of the Never states. Never had a union. Well, yeah, well, well, you know, at least in Kentucky, in Kentucky, you've got a long history of, you know, union families and kind of the minor families and stuff. So there's that kind of kind of ethos, but not Colorado and Arizona at all. No, no, not one bit. So pretty incredible. And I just thought there was, uh, you know, the fact that, um, you know, in Kentucky, man, if you want to you want to poke the bear, man, um, the governor, Matt Bevin, certainly did it this week. I mean, who we can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, that, that's another thing um, that I saw and I didn't know how anyone didn't like laugh at him when he said that. Yeah, no I, kidding. I, I probably would have laughed in the guy's face. But if he's talking about like saying these teacher walkouts are causing kids to be sexually abused or, you know, do drugs for the first time and stuff like that. I'm like, man, you are hitting all the talking points um, from the, like these, these right wing groups, like in one foul swoop. Yeah, exactly. Not even trying to ha- hide it. Yeah. And show me, and show me like one thing that that guy has done in support of sexual assault victims, right. Of people who've been physically abused of, of poison control and regulation or uh, kind of like um, efforts to kind of actually provide kind of um, meaningful drug interventions, nothing. Right. So it's like, it's only, you know, whatever. This is a guy who just gets up there and this is what he says. Go play with your spidget finner. And that's it. <laughs> it's like, he just like, that guy, I couldn't believe he did it. And then he comes out and he gives a half-hearted apology after there's been such a national kickback. You know, and the teachers, uh, the teachers and, and like even the state Democrats were like, I don't care if you apologize. I don't accept your apology. We're going we're gonna to take you out. We got to get you out of office and we're going to mobilize to say, see ya. Yeah. Crazy. Um, so that was that. And so, you know, today, in addition, I just want to kind of jump down to, um, because that kind of movement's going on and kind of teachers mass mobilization across the state today also is a national walkout day and the 19th anniversary of the Columbine massacre. So the kind of same students from, from Parkland, Florida, Florida, um, who have been, you know, kind of raising the issue of kind of, uh, meaningful gun regulation and control, um, the banning of assault weapon, all this kind of stuff um, are, are at it again. And now we're seeing high schools across the country are already out on the streets. And right as we were going to air, Sean, you were saying that, OK, it's already begun in Philadelphia. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's already taking place in Philly. Um, I did not even realize there was walkouts today. So that, that, that was news to me. Oh, my God. My God. <laughs> I'll feel I'll fear embarrassed for you, Sean. <laughs> that you don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, the other thing I just you got to check this out. Um, this was alarming news to me this week where um, there's an article in the journal Nature about the Atlantic Ocean circulation. And, uh, you know, this is the kind of stuff he, we, I remember this talking like a day about, after tomorrow. Yeah. So well, let, like, let, let me give you the scenario. Right. So I'm ser- when I was serious about the Kim Stanley Robinson science in the capital stuff, why the, he's such a good science fiction writer is because, you know, he pays super attention to, um, you know, to the science and kind of you're taking out, okay, what if, what happens if you follow out the, some of these models? Right. And so basically what happens if you imagine the circulation, right, there's cold air, there's cold water, 
I'm sorry, there's warm water that comes up kind of through, not exactly the center of the Atlantic Ocean, but heads up towards Europe, right? And that provides some of the kind of temperate climates of Europe because it brings that warm water up to the surface. As it gets up there, it starts to cool, right? And it starts to cool right in the area around Greenland, right? So it starts to cool in there, and then that water sinks, right? That water sinks down and then kind of runs back along the coast of the uh, coast of the U.S., right? Um, back to the south again at, at deep levels. So that's some of the ways that you get some of the, you know, uh, if you watch the fishing routes, right? The fishing routes, they follow the same, um, the same circulation, depending on what you're, what you're looking for. So the problem is, is that, that the, that sinking water depends upon that being salty water. Now, what's happening is that you've got the melt off from the glaciers in Greenland and Iceland and these other places that is actually introducing all this fresh water into the ocean. So not only are we kind of talking about the melting of, of the glaciers, but it's actually desalinizing the water, which basically makes it lighter, right? Which makes it not sink. And so when it stops sinking, it takes away the mechanism that creates that circulation. So anyways, that's that that's, a, I mean, my understanding of the science of it. But so what happens is that not only are you talking about, um, you know, massive climate change, I mean, like actual like regional climate change in Europe, right, taking away that Mediterranean climate. Um, but you're you're talking about a dynamic that it could potentially bring in like extended, like severe freezes um, to the entire East Coast of the United States. So if you read actually the Ken Stanley Robinson um, Science in the Capital series, um, it goes through this scenario and kind of what that actually looks like, right? And what it would take to try to restart that um, that circulation. And, you know, one of the things that we talked about way back when, Sean, uh, when Trump was first taking office and the chaos was just beginning, was the fact that um, these are the things that we're not able to see happening, right? Because of the craziness in the Trump administration, we're not paying attention to these things like climate change. And I don't I, look like, at I'm not saying to heap kind of blame on the left or something like this. I mean, it's just like there's so much going on that, you know, we don't have we have to resist so much at, at, at kind of at once that this is the kind of stuff that could potentially be be catastrophic um, and why it's so important to kind of, you know, kind of move forward on this stuff. So um, I'd encourage people to look in the show notes and check out um, check out the article, get an article for the Washington Post and um, um, something talking a little about the journal um, that, in the journal Nature. Um, and also, you know, look, read Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Science, um, Science in the Capital. His books is actually a trilogy um, for what that actually looks like, because, you know, I almost think that we've got to get to the point where we're getting super serious, which is why I was so happy to see that in New York City, um, they voted to kind of divest from fossil fuels. And that's the first major U.S. city. Um, that is kind of taking that initiative and say, okay, we got to, we got to do something. We got to do something. We got to do something now. And this is, um, something that we can do at our particular locations. And I hope to see we, this start happening at, um, you know, in colleges and universities across the country. We saw that during the South Africa divestment campaigns, um, but also in cities across the country, because, um, you know, this administration is certainly not going to do anything. We've got Scott Pruitt at the head of the EPA, which basically is a climate denier. Now we got a new NASA administrator who's also a climate denier, um, 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 and meanwhile, um, things are going to pot real fast. So um, not to put, you know, too much of a downer around the day, Sean, but that's it's pretty big news. <laughs> yeah, I would say. <laughs> uh, in other news, the Brennan Center report, I'll just kind of blow through this a little bit. Um, Brennan Center report this week, good news. New Jersey passed um, um, new laws that basically embrace automatic voter registration in the state that is absolutely huge um you see this as a strategy of blue states across the country quote unquote blue states across the country as a way to kind of like deepen the amount of um, participation from among democratic voters um right again it's not i mean again it, it registers everybody so it's not targeted to democratic voters but you're talking about increasing in voter registration tends to lean in the democratic way um which you know reminds me and maybe we can you can talk a little about this, about, about that dude, we're, I'm just forgetting his name, that we're talking about was on the majority report this year or, or this week, um, talking about some of the things that we need to do to get serious um, about um, about fighting back. But um, I was psyched to see that. And uh, the Brennan Center report basically saying, look, we've got more bills expanding voter rights now than otherwise. It's an incredible, incredible pushback. So, Yeah. Uh, I think it was with David Ferris. David Ferris. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, like back in uh, 2016, was saying that like New York, states like New York and California should use compulsory voting just to drive that wedge between the popular vote and the um, <clears throat> the other votes more uh, to drive that wedge uh, more between the electoral college and the uh, popular vote. 
Right. And there's even some, you know, there's some of those, we talked about this once on the show. Um, there's some proposals to actually have mandatory voting too as well, which would be that next step. Um, and so the idea there is, you know, we, we saw what's happened with the electoral college. I mean, now you've got two Republican presidents, George W. Bush and uh, Donald Trump now who have, who have uh, won the electoral college, but lost the popular vote. Um, and we know what the consequences of those administrations have been. So the idea is that, you know, it's, it's a political move, right. You know, to kind of drive that, um, the distance between the electoral college um, and the popular vote even further um, to kind of like underscore um the need for kind of fundamental reform of the system. So, um, and just in a little bit of sweet justice, Chris, Chris Kovac, who I just think is one of the most disgusting and despicable human beings, right. in the Republican party who has done everything to lead the kind of voter disenfranchisement movement to kind of basically try to find innovative new ways of making sure that people can't vote. The guy who was appointed ahead of uh, Trump's like voter fraud thing, you know, looking for ways to kind of justify Trump's claims that all these illegal immigrants voted, all that kind of stuff. Um, this guy is held in contempt of court. And I swear to God, I hope this guy goes to prison because, um, you know, he was the he was, in a sense, one of the architects of uh, the Republican plans to disenfranchise voters across the country. So sweet justice for you, Chris Kovac. May you go away for a long time. So, yeah. And Sean, what do you think about this move um, from, uh, you know, Next Gen America to host all these town halls and stuff across the country? Um, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> um, you know, I saw that uh, there was one in um, in uh, Allentown last week with yeah. uh, in the Pennsylvania 7th. That included uh, Edwards, Morganelli, Susan Wilde, and a few other people. Um, no, I, 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 li- I, li- I like those ideas. I think they had one with um, out here in the 10th as well. Yeah, they have. I mean, they've been had, you know, it's been wild tracking some of this stuff um, about what's going on. I mean, he's been had forums out in Iowa, um, out in Milwaukee, right, um, across the country. And we just kind of barnstorming one place to the other. And this guy's, you know, uh, well, one of the few Democratic billionaires, right, or kind of billionaires who votes Democratic or is progressive. Um, and it's been amazing to see that. You know him taking such an active an active role and saying we need to push this forward and the Democratic Party is not going fast enough. I mean, I was blown away one night when I'm sitting there. You know, I didn't know this was going to happen and just kind of watching the news. And an ad comes on and it's Tom Steyer right coming on and basically calling for the impeachment of Donald Trump right like in a one minute um, and making his kind of one minute case about the need to impeach. Um, so I mean, holy crap! I mean, this is this has been something else. Um, to see that kind of movement. And, you know, look, it's, given what we've seen from the DCCC in terms of their um, attempts to undercut progressive candidates um, in uh, in local elections, right, in local, regional, statewide elections, um, this is actually, I think, a nice counterbalance um, to um, give a forum and a platform for folks um, in the kind of progressive kind of wing of the Democratic Party, or at least running in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. <clears throat> Yeah, and I know that, that that's a uh, district that looks like a DCCC staying out of uh, because of an earlier er, earlier incidents. So it's nice not having them in, in, involved in general. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's funny. It's like if that early incident, if that early incident hadn't come hadn't come forward, then we might not even know. Um, we might not even know that they were attempting to do that, right? So. Whatever. It's good. So cool. So we've got, um, you know, so again, it was just a week of crazy uh, um, at the national level. Um, we're going to kind of take a quick break and we come back. We're going to get into some of the uh, the fun stuff happening here in Pennsylvania. Um, Sean was on the ground out in the Capitol. Sean's kind of made a big move this week. Um, Sean's gotten all fancy on us. So um, it's kind of a pretty good, uh, pretty good transition to the state uh, um, to the state park tonight. All right. So this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. I um, just want to remind everybody. You want to support Raging Chicken. You want to support the work that Sean does. You want to support the work that our awesome writers do. You want to support some of the investigative work that I'm doing right now with the Colleen Bradley case and so on. Uh, become a member of Raging Chicken Press by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Become a member for as little as five bucks a month. Um, I look, Pay attention to your uh, Facebook feeds this week, too, as well, folks, because I might have a nice little special giveaway to people, uh, which maybe I'll talk about um, in the second segment. Um, this is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We will be back right after this break with more. <laughs> I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. 
On this day in labor history, the year was 2010. That was the day the Deepwater Horizon oil rig exploded in the Gulf of Mexico, killing 11 workers and injuring 17 more. The rig experienced an initial blowout, releasing an uncontrollable flow of oil and gas from the well. Hydrocarbons then ignited, causing the explosion and fire. It caused a massive offshore oil spill of over 4 billion barrels and is considered the largest environmental disaster in U.S. history. British Petroleum was the main operator responsible for the well's design. The drilling contractor, TransOcean, owned and operated the rig. A handful of smaller companies were also involved. While company and governmental officials initially argued the explosion was unforeseeable and then subsequently blamed each other, there were warning signs in the months leading up to the deadly explosion. Multiple equipment failures, design deficiencies, poor preventative maintenance, bad engineering decisions, and a chase for profits that emphasized low worker injuries at the expense of process safety all combined to create the disaster. As well, regulations and standards enforcement were weak in an almost totally deregulated industry. One phrase used by investigators to characterize the explosion was the normalization of deviance. From workers to managers to executives, none saw the explosion coming. There were dozens of contributing factors, as the Chemical Safety Board investigation noted. They listed 57 key technical, human, and regulatory factors in their 2016 final report. However, engineers had raised concerns about the potential failure of key equipment. Workers were sensitive to the fact that they could be fired for raising safety concerns that delayed drilling. BP was ultimately found responsible and racked up over $70 billion in fines, cleanup, and settlement costs. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. So fancy, everybody. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Sean, so fancy. <laughs> yeah, so Sean, you had a you had a big breakout this week, man. I mean, congrats on uh, you know on the first post that for the uh, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center's blog, Third in State, had a great piece on there um, about Trump's tax plan. Um, congrats, man. That's awesome. Thank you. Yes, it's called the Trump Tax Bill wasn't for you. Yes, Basically, right. pretty much how the um, 99% are getting screwed over and shafted by the 1% with tax returns. Yeah, and this is based upon what? It's a recent report that was released. Is that right? Yes. Uh, no, but basically like a sh- like large sh- basically a large share of the provisions uh, from the tax return, especially the uh, temporary ones that are meant to help out the middle class or dubbed as middle class tax breaks. Um, I think like 65% of them are all going to people in the top 20% and 25% of that is going to be going to the top one and the next 4%. Um, so pretty much the rich are benefiting in um, 60, I think like all in all of like 47, 47, 50 states, uh, the top 1% received more in uh, federal tax dollars uh, from federal returns than the uh, bottom 60%. So in Pennsylvania, the top 1% received 26% of the gains, while the bottom uh, 60 received 13 Pretty crazy. It's a great, it was a great article, man. And, I, and so you're going to be writing for them um, kind of more often now, from what I understand. Yes. Yep. So Sean is uh, breaking into the establishment, everybody. So uh, I want you to kind of use this as a marker. Write this down. It is 420. It will not be hard to understand. And remember. All right, it's 420. So is this the moment that Sean Kitchen becomes hashtag resistant Democrat? That's the question. <laughs> but will he be embraced? Will he embrace? I'll become the next Matt Iglesias. There you go, man. There you go. No, we're going to see you on MSNBC in no time, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, great. No, good stuff. Good stuff. Do check it out. Um, you, you've heard us talk about um, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center stuff before. I mean, really, their work is invaluable. Um, and, you know, I just find it like kind of pleasingly ironic that Sean is writing about budget stuff. I mean, given the fact that when I talk about budget stuff, <laughs> usually Sean's like, what, what, what's my Twitter feed say? What's my Twitter feed say? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I am uh, 
watching uh, the fallout of the latest um, Daryl Metcalf rant on Twitter right now. Oh, are you really? <laughs> yes. Uh, this actually stems from one, some of my original reporting. So maybe let's go into that next. Yeah, let's go right to, let me just say this, button up that one last thing. It said one thing I just said about the Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center. I mean, really, their stuff is invaluable. Um, there's there's literally between uh, PABC and um, and the Research. Research Center is that um, you know there are no people that are really breaking down um, the implications of both national and statewide policy um, and what that actually means for everyday working folks. So. Um, check out their stuff. It's it's absolutely critical, and I'm so psyched that Sean's going to be there uh, writing for them too as well and helping bring in the, you know, the voice that he's brought to Raging Chicken, um, bringing that kind of analysis and kind of like attention to detail that he's that, that he's, he's always had a, a, a pension for um, um, to those pages too as well. Um, but let's, you know, move away. And I, and I, I think I did good with, I think I did good with it, the wonky writing and explaining that stuff, so it's, a, it's good to finally be able to do that, do a little bit more professional writing. Yeah, there you go establishment um <laughs> the uh, uh <laughs> but so from the from the uh from spreadsheet sheets and seriousness to the wild world of daryl metcalf uh what's going on once again <laughs> two weeks in a row um so uh last week there was that controversial uh gerrymandering bill um that daryl metcalf decided to uh gore his opponents in a very Machiavellian way in public. You know, that's pretty much like what this was. I mean, I'm pretty sure like Metcalf was probably sleeping all night, uh, you know, with, with the little blue pill thinking about what he was going to be doing the next day. Like, like, I mean, I think like that's how he was reacting, right? You know, he was probably up all night thinking it's like, man, I'm really going to fuck over these liberals in the morning. And that's what he did with this, uh, the gerrymandering bill. I mean, he gutted it in a Machiavellian way. He gored his opponents in public. And he did this, and afterwards, uh, State Representative Chris Rabb uh, pretty much called him out on it. Um, you know, Rabb went up to uh, Chairman Bradford, who is the Democrat on the committee, and um, pretty much said that, uh, you know, congrats, thank you for doing this, blah, blah, blah. Metcalf overheard it. Uh, Rabb goes, you know, even for you, uh, this is a new low. I didn't think you can go any lower than this, but you did. <laughs> you me wrong. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing at this point, but this is like what happened. And then they, they exchanged words back and forth. And um, Rab pretty much, uh, Metcalf, or Metcalf tells Rab, uh, we'd have a different conversation if this was out in the street. And <laughs> so, 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 yes, exactly. That's the moment that we have, like, basically the Western standoff. <laughs> so, what, what, what? What did he mean by that, Sean? Um, well, so Chris Rabb is, uh, or no, Daryl Metcalf is, um, is, is rumored to be carrying, packing heat while in the Capitol. He's been rumored to carry a gun on him around for a while. Uh, he never tells anyone if he's carrying or not, but he does carry while he's in the Capitol. Um, he just won't admit it uh, due to security reasons. He said this in an article a couple months ago uh, that was done by the caucus. Um, and, you know, Chris Rabb makes a point. It's like you have people like Nick McAreilly, who is who is accused of rape and beating uh, or, and harassing, you know, verbally and sexually and physically harassing uh, colleagues of his. Um, and you have Daryl Metcalf going around the Capitol with guns. I mean, there are people in that building who are packing heat. And it, it also, like, who's to stop one of these people from popping off on someone one day? No, exactly. Especially with someone like and, and, Metcalf, who's so concerned that people just get a little too close to him all the time. Yeah, a little touchy-feely. Um, and so now Metcalf uh, went, uh, woke up today because, um, you know, uh, so, well, let me finish this out then. The way I noticed this story um, was video of March on Harrisburg. Uh, they had on their Facebook feed. I had a couple of other videos, but I wasn't really like all the chaos that was going on. I have video of uh, Metcalf and Rab exchanging words inside the committee, but you can't hear because of everything that's happening around. Uh, it's a really tight, cramped, cramped space. Uh, they only fit like 30 people in the room, plus the committee members. Um, so it was really cramped. And um, so you see them going back and forth. And then out in the hallway is when Rab's goes up to the news person and ask him what he meant by this. Uh, we'd have a different conversation on the streets. Are you going to shoot me? Like, <laughs> he said this to a news reporter. I get the back end of this and I, you know, start digging into it and, you know, we 
talk back and forth. And Rab was like, no, this is exactly what I said. And I said in the video to the news reporter, is this a threat? And so Rab has filed a complaint and, um, you know, he is doing everything possible within his realm to uh, make this public. Um, you know, he was a union organizer. He's taking, you know, he's doing everything by the rules that allows him to do, you know, play a more hardball. And then uh, Metcalf went off on a rant this morning. And so basically, uh, somehow he dry, he drags Representative Sims into this, calling him a lying homosexual, Brian Sims. Um, <laughs> and this is all over, uh, what do call it? This is all over, um, who's his name? Uh, Metcalf and Rab getting into an argument. This is nuts, man. And people wonder why uh, others outside the realms of the Keystone State look in at what they see here and they just like can't believe it. Right. Um, people like Daryl Metcalf that we allow um, to stay in office. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it, it's amazing to see how far people willing are willing to go uh, to defend Daryl Metcalf. Like, I, I think uh, it's like the limbo line with like the top GOP staffers and see how willing they are like <laughs> to bend their backs. Daryl Metcalf and defend this guy. I'm <laughs> it's like we said we say it all the time, right? Is that is that they will carry their water, Daryl Metcalf's water, till the fucking ends of the earth, to the very last possible minute, and nothing. I like this this rant calling this rant calling one of your representatives a lying homosexual yep. on Facebook is not going to get him kicked off the House State Government Committee. No, no. They'll sit, they'll sit there, they'll shake their heads, they'll feel personally bad, they'll kind of all that kind of, but they will do nothing to censure this dude, um, to kind of make him, hold him accountable for what it is. So therefore, you have to basically say, all right, you guys have your opportunity and you're doing nothing with it. So therefore, you are the biggest enablers of Daryl Metcalf like, and his ilk right there. So don't give me the like, there's good Republicans. Well, where the hell are they? Oh man, Daryl Metcalf, always good for uh, whatever closing. The yeah, out, I guess. But uh, so, but in in on the other end, also in the Capitol this week, you were there for these like amazing rallies um, on on Monday. Yes, the uh, fair districts had their big gerrymandering rally. Um, I think like probably close to a thousand people showed up. Uh, they had the rotunda completely packed on the first and second floors. And even in the third and fourth floors as well, like you would, you you, would, you saw people holding gerrymandering signs on the third floor of the center column of the Capitol Rotunda, which is like right below the Supreme Court. It was incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. I mean, the images from that rally were just um, were amazing. I mean, you know, we've seen all the all the pictures from you know these massive occupations from uh, state capitals around the country. We see the uh, what's happening with the you know um, when the teachers have been holding these huge rallies and occupying floors. I mean, going right back to Wisconsin when we saw the occupation of the state capitol there. I mean, those images were reminiscent of of, of that kind of occupation. It was pretty impressive. I mean, yeah, and that's what could happen here in Pennsylvania. Yeah, it could, man. You know, I mean, I, I remember standing on the state, the capital steps in different contexts. Well, related, I mean, kind of on um, budget cuts and all this other kind of stuff in the state capital. Um, and, you know, calling basically for people and Rick Smith calling for people say, look, you just got to be prepared to bring your sleeping bags. Right. I mean, you're going to come for these one like, you know, day and done kind of uh, rallies. That's all great. Um, but we're going to have to actually step it up at some point and uh, make that a little more permanent. Sean, you've got a big shit eating grin on your face. <laughs> I was on my Twitter feed. <laughs> I know. Another thing about like, uh, uh, Mysic has weighed in on Metcalf. Uh, pretty much like, dude, get over it. <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm not paying attention. <laughs> no, please. No, don't worry about it. Don't let me, don't let us like, you know, hold you up, Sean, with your, you know, <laughs> the podcast get in the way of your Twitter feed, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but uh yeah so that's kind of pretty cool stuff um so anything else going on in uh the statewide politics um there's the stuff with the uh the the abortion bans last week oh, yeah, uh yeah charlie dent yep, retirement yep. which nah, the special election will probably happen i hope i hope it's like the last possible minute well it's just kind of crazy you know whatever i mean 
you know, again, well, let, let's take one at a time here. It's like, so first let's talk about the, the abortion ban. Like, uh, my, my, I think the indications are that Wolf will, will, will vote this down. Oh, this is just a, this is just red meat for the base. Right. Exactly. This, this is fundraising money. Like they would never, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, but they, I mean, yeah, it might be just like, like for the base, for electoral politics, things like this, but these are people who actually like, they're looking for any way possible. Um, to get something through. So they wouldn't walk away from this if Wolf would sign it. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, they, they, and they made that lady, um, Kathy Rapp, head of the House Health Committee. <laughs> uh, she's the one who writes this shitty legislation and gets it passed down to her from, like, outside special interest groups. And we called her out on that once before, and she, we called her off guard, and she did not like that. <laughs> did not like that one bit. <laughs> no, she did not. <laughs> Yeah, you had her uh, like deer in headlights on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we usually like to catch politicians. <laughs> yeah, exactly, unprepared, right? Um, wait, what? Somebody's watching? What? <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. And then Charlie Dent stuff. I mean, Charlie Dent stepping down. I mean, you know, he's been working really hard to kind of come on. Well, these resistance Republicans. I guess the rubber band snapped. Right, exactly. He's just looking for a way to... Uh, uh, you know, um, kind of become the darling of uh, of uh, centrist Democrats and kind of saying, see, he's a good guy, right, um, to try to, you know, basically make sure that his political fortunes are, are not going to be too closely tied um, to the, the, the disaster that is the Trump administration um, so that he's got a, a, a future down the road. I mean, that's what it looks like to me. Yeah, without a doubt. <laughs> So it's crazy. And I think, you know, and after if we'll see what happens in 2018 and like, I don't know if he's positioned himself for a run of governor. Right. Or if he's actually, you know, looking, he's got his eyes on kind of even higher office, like the presidential down down the road. But um, but we shall see. Yeah. So crazy. Sean is just cracking up at his Twitter feed here. So. Because <laughs> you all expect Metcalf to give you like entertainment first thing on a Friday morning. <laughs> crazy all right anything else for uh segment two sean um hmm. no because they're re- the legislators are going to be on break oh i pissed off of uh, wagner royally the yesterday oh, that's- yeah i was videotaping him getting out of his uh his van and he saw me with my cell phone like this coming behind the van he just like gave me like this shit, shit eating look and was just snarling at me over that <laughs> he didn't come over and deck you no he didn't I was I was afraid for my life. I thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> did he make the move? Like did he like try to get you to flinch? <laughs> no. <laughs> but you could tell I was obviously recording him. Yeah, good. Good. Knowing people watch this stuff is important. All right, folks, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about Last Call. Yes, it is the return of Space News and a sad day for our coverage of Pizza Boy. <laughs> This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Um, We'll be back right after this with just more from the... This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Over the past six years, we've brought unapologetic, progressive, activist media to Pennsylvania and beyond. We've helped hold those in power accountable and shine a light on some amazing activist work. We've broken national stories and established a reputation as an aggressive, independent media site. As newsrooms close and traditional journalists lose their jobs, hard-hitting, investigative news suffers. If we care about our democracy, we have to find new, sustainable models of journalism. And frankly, no one's going to do it for us. After the Trump election, we dug in even deeper. Thanks to some longtime members, one-time donations, and a shift in other resources, we brought on more writers and started paying them. Now we're doubling down and want to expand our infrastructure and pay our writers even more. We need to invest in our media if we have a chance to resist the unprecedented assault on democracy, working families, women's rights, and our planet. History will remember the choices we make today. So take a minute to become a member of Raging Chicken Press. For as little as $5 a month, the price of a local craft beer or a cup of coffee, you will be supporting homegrown progressive journalists and media activists. Go to RagingChickenPress.org and click on the Support and Membership tab to become a member. Leave a one-time donation or learn about other ways that you can help. We don't have billionaire backers. 
Keeping progressive, activist media going strong depends on you. Thank you for all your help and support. Keep up the fight. And as national walkouts continue, uh, more students are headed to the streets. Uh, we're going to look to the skies for a little bit here because it is the return of space news, right? Because um, it's been a crazy week for space. Um, this is going to be my fun. I got no beer stuff this week at all. So um, my head was definitely in the clouds. A uh, big week in space news. Um, on the one hand, um, NASA has launched on Wednesday. Um, first, they were supposed to go on Monday. Um, they had to put off the launch until fr- uh, Wednesday. Um, launched this um, transiting exoplanet survey satellite, or TESS. Um, that went up and launched with uh, SpaceX on a SpaceX rocket. Really cool stuff. I mean, it's basically uh, a, it's a satellite, but it's like a telescope that is going to specifically be um, being studying exoplanets. I mean, exoplanets have kind of kind of made it in the news fairly frequently over the past kind of like year and a half. Um, just because scientists are discovering all these other um, these exoplanets, in other words, planets that are circulating other stars and other solar systems, um, and many of them are in what's been called the habitable zone or the Goldilocks zone, right? You know, not too hot, not too cold, right? That has the potential to support um, life, which is really, really cool stuff. And so, um, what they expect this satellite to do um, and this this telescope to be able to do is actually bring us even better imaging and better data about some of these exoplanets. So that's like, a, you know, kind of really, really cool stuff. Um, and I just c- completely geeked out at some of this, too. And I had to go back and look at some of the orbiter um, pictures of, you know, the uh, the Jupiter orbiter that was going around looking at some of the pictures that were that, um, that were taken around Jupiter. I just, you know, I'm always just blown away by some of this stuff. And so that's going to be really cool to watch another round of it. Um, also, next month, NASA is going to be launching a new Mars rover called InSight. And they're actually going to be looking at, um, this is the first time they've ever had an interplanetary like launch, right? something that's going to another planet like Mars, um, from the West Coast. So that's been kind of that big deal on the West Coast. They've got these um, like events going on up and down the coast where... Uh, you know, families could come in and kids can see models of the orbiter and that kind of stuff. And my daughter loves, like, look at the space stuff, especially, you know, and this is what I've, I've always loved about NASA is that you look at so many of the engineers and so many of the kind of um, the people working on it. Um, I, I don't know the exact percentages, but you see so many women in leadership roles in NASA, which is which is incredible. So, like, a lot of the interviews that you see with the, some of the engineers and some of the researchers and the scientists are with women, right? And so my daughter just loves this stuff seeing kind of women actually kind of um, being part of the engineering team that's designing this rover that's going to go to Mars to study earthquake activity and seismic activity on the planet to better understand it. I mean, just kind of really cool. Um, and they've, you know, they, they've been going out of their way to really, um, uh, you know, to kind of think about that next generation of researchers, which seems all the more critical at a time which, which NASA is kind of really practically under assault um, in very, in weird way, and I'd say in different ways. Like in the past where people have been trying to kind of defund NASA, now you've got Mike Pence, who is basically all in on kind of like the space industry stuff. Um, And it's the kind of thing that I've been talking about incessantly on this, uh, you know, on our podcast, the kind of thing that kind of makes Sean go to sleep. um, But it's about the kind of development of the space industry. Um, And Mike Pence is kind of like, you know, he's looking to the stars for like the next trillionaire um, mission, you know, looking for, um, you know, how are we going to kind of exploit resources in space to kind of um, make more concentrated wealth um, kind of on, on planet Earth? And that's really what it's all about. And if you need any more evidence than that, is that there was a conference, I, I think it was out in Colorado, but I'm not 100% sure, that um, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross um, gave an interview uh, to CNBC this week. Um, and he was out there um, at this conference talking about the space industry. So what's fascinating about what's going on here is that you, you're having, like, exploration aspects of space falling to NASA, right? Where, but the Commerce Secretary, Wilbur Ross, is now, you know, billionaire Wilbur Ross is now being put in charge of um, kind of coordinating policy, right, and economic, the economic kind of advancement um, of um, U.S. corporate interest into space, Right. Um, so he, according to this interview on, C- on CNBC, he says right now the space industry is a three hundred billion dollar industry. OK. 
and he expects it to balloon to over a trillion dollars fairly quickly. And so he has been charged basically to find ways of coordinating policy and basically setting policy that is going to be favorable um, to the kind of economic regime that we have right now. Now, that's that should set off alarm bells, right, to anyone kind of in the who's kind of interested in questions of uh, economic inequality and so on. Because if they are setting policy now for something that is still about 10 years down the road before we're actually going to be due realistically, like, for example, mining asteroids um, 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 for regime, then th that policy that's going into effect now is going to dramatically impact um, economic inequality back here. Because if, if, if Wilbur Ross gets his, um, um, you know, gets his wishes, basically what we're going to be doing is they fully full scale neoliberal privatization of space resources. <laughs> Um, and which means that just like we saw the offshoring um, of, of companies here in the U.S. looking for cheap labor, so that, and then the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few, that is just going to explode. Um, if you've got folks that are going to be able to be able to mine platinum and gold and all sorts of kind of um, uh, uh, kind of minerals and uh, and other resources from kind of the asteroid belt around Mars, um, that and they're able to hold all those profits, and they're, they're going to be distributed. Um, for private gain, you know, to be all about private gain and not common gain, gain that's, 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 that's insane. Um, so at the very time that we should be talking about kind of, you know, kind of global um, resistance, um, the kind of stuff that we saw at the turn of the, uh, the 21st century, when we saw, you know, people talking about another world as possible. Um, and I have to give a plug in and, you know, Sean, you'll appreciate this because uh, you kind of rolled your eyes when you first saw this. In these times, Right, I came out with an issue, and I have to admit, I was like, "Oh my God, I found my, my, my this is my glory." Uh, they came out with an article. It was, a, it was an interview with Kim Stanley Robinson, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he's a science fiction writer, but is also thinks a lot about kind of these issues. And the article was called um, "Space: The Final Socialist Frontier?" Question mark. Right, and Kim Stanley Robinson makes the point here, and as as a case that I've been making for um, too as well, is like, I don't think it, we can simply be kind of deniers about what is going to happen in terms of the advancement of the space industry. It has to be about the terms for which um, any of this stuff happens. Because my belief is whether or not this kind of further kind of like, you know, we start becoming a multi-planetary species like Elon Musk wants us to do whatever it is that, what's going to affect everybody are the terms under which this happens, right? So in my mind, right, we should be thinking about kind of collective resource Right um, in space, we should say this is not an era for kind of um, private wealth extraction, right? And that should be kind of how we're kind of thinking about these terms. But I give everybody, you know, I'll put a link for this in the in the show notes too as well. Check out the article in, in these times. The interview with um, Kim Stanley Robinson is absolutely fantastic. And last thing I'll say in my space news for this week is that uh, there was like the showdown in the uh, in the Senate this week where um, um, Bridenstein, who is, you know, he's this kind of like climate denying, like corrupt um, former Navy pilot um, who is basically was put forward. His name is Jim Bridenstine. He was put forward as uh, Trump's nomination to head NASA. And it's faced stiff opposition, especially from um, legislators that are from states that are surround the state, the uh, uh, space industry, like Florida and so on. Saying this guy is not qualified for the job. As a matter of fact, when he had a he had a Air and Space Museum in Arizona, I want to say Texas, uh, I can't remember, um, um, Oklahoma, I guess. But what, what basically when when he headed that, basically he used this where. There was a, a company that got started up. They were trying to do jet racing, like, you know, basically like you have jets race in the sky with these VR things, whatever. Um, but it was a fledgling company. He bought full into this. So he was tapped to head this nonprofit organization. It was like a space museum. And he basically got the space museum to sponsor one of these jet racing things that fed directly back into his own pockets, right, for one of his teams that would be this jet racing. So anyways, you got another level of corruption is going ahead of NASA. Huge pushback. And initially, Jeff Flake, right, Jeff Flake came out and said he would not vote for Jim, um, Jim Bridenstine um, because he was um, gonna basically not qualified. There were questions about the corruption. But uh, guess what? Mike Pence was out of town and not available. So that if Jeff Flake had decided not to vote for this guy forward, it would have been a 49-49 tie, right? And then Bridenstine would not have gotten the approval. So apparently Jeff Flake did not have the stomach for that. 
right? They looked around and said, Mike Pence, where's Mike Pence? Where's Mike? Where's Mike? And Mike was nowhere to be found. So Jeff Flake said, oh, let me rethink what I'm going to do. So, you know, ethical Jeff Flake, uh, this is really what it gets. Is he, there's no difference between him and the rest of them. So uh, now we've got a, a climate-denying, corrupt, corrupt politician um, at the head of NASA at the very time that Mike Pence and uh, the, our, our kind of good pal, <coughs> excuse me, um, our, our good pal Wilbur Ross are set to make a full-on power economic wealth grab from space industry stuff. Man, it's, uh, you know, you couldn't write a better premise for a science fiction trilogy right there. So, Sean, you can wake up now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm alive. You're alive. Yeah, he made it through, everybody. It's, uh, it's unbelievable. So uh, that's, my, that's my, like, short clip space news for the week. Uh, but the big, big news for today's last call is uh, Sean is saying buh bye to Pizza Boy. Sean, it's 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 been a good run, man. It's been a good run. <laughs> yep. It's been a couple, couple years since I've been working there, and uh, it's done after this week, after Sunday. It's done. So you're happy to move on then? Yes. Extremely. Extremely. <laughs> Are you I mean, it's, what's that? it's not what I wanted to be doing out here. You know, bartending. So I've got a couple of jobs last me through the end of the year uh, out here and I'm um, doing stuff that I want to do. So and I'll be able to, I have a lot more free time on my hands and I'll be able to write more. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's awesome. So, you know, I mean, if this is anything like, look, it's been, I mean, you know, Sean got out, he had to, you know, uh, work with Pizza Boy um, for all his time. We got great beer reports from him and things like this. He's kind of like, uh, and knows the craft beer um, kind of industry and scene pretty well. Um, but, you know, going right to your point is like, that's not why you came out to Harrisburg. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I finally got stuff to carry me over for the next, uh, till the end of the year. And I'm looking to turn it into a uh, full time job <laughs> at some point or do election based stuff. So, yeah, man, good for you, man. I'm really, I'm, I'm psyched for you. And, you know, I, I, I want to use that as an, also as an opportunity just to kind of say a couple things and make and, and make a plea to everybody, right? And to say a couple things is like, this is, you know, I know it's a pain in the ass to kind of hear me asking you to become a member every week, right? Ask you to say, become a member of Raging Chicken for five bucks a month, right? Um, Patreon.com slash RC Press, right? And the, the whole idea here is that we should be able to support writers like Sean, Right. So that they can actually devote their time and energies to actually doing this kind of work. Right. Um, the fact is, is that most of us who do this kind of work are forced to go like, you know, work completely another job in completely another industry. Um, you know, someone like me, I'm doing this as a side project. I work as a faculty member. Right. And if I hadn't had a union faculty position, there's no way that this Raging Chicken Press would even exist. Let me be clear about that. Um, and, but you know, it would have been, you know, Sean was lucky enough to be able to piece together an income, right. And to be able to kind of bring the kind of coverage and the exposés that he's brought from Harrisburg, right. Imagine if you were actually kind of, um, paid him what he deserved, right. And the only one that's going to do that are people like you. I mean, people who are going to step up to the plate and support progressive media, um, to be able to kind of pay writers to do this kind of work. So I don't know, man. And, you know, I have to say this, too, as well as like, you know, as you know, as the one thing that I've been thinking a lot about this week, Sean, is that, um, you know, especially after you, you publish that piece and, uh, you know, you got you start writing for uh, kind of third and state for uh, Pennsylvania Budget and Policy Center, um, is that I remember when we first started Raging Chicken. Right. I remember when, you know, you were new to this kind of writing. Right. Um, and I've seen, you know, I, I mean, and, you know, you've said this to me so many different times, kind of your writing improve and deepen and get more critical that you've been able to kind of build networks of, uh, of kind of connections out there in Harrisburg. You've dug deep into, you know, kind of say kind of Apple research kind of stuff in ways that nobody else has been doing that. And, you know, I don't think that, you know, had it not been for, you know, an institution like Raging Chicken, Right. Where you have that actually opportunity to kind of, you know, develop those skills. Right. Um, where do you go? You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that, you know, this is why, you know, looking for if there's people that are interested in doing this kind of work. Right. This is what's possible. Yes, it takes a long time. Yes, it's a hard slog. But, you know, I, I've been I've been reading um, um, 
Um, uh, <clears throat> I, I'll talk about that later. Um, I, well, maybe I should talk. About, well, anyways, I, I've been thinking a lot about uh, about the the need to actually push and build these kind of institutions, um, and um, how much it pushes everybody um, who's doing this kind of work to the breaking point at some point because we're juggling so many things at the same time. Just trying try to make ends meet, try to kind of like you know fit in what we want to do um, versus um, what we're able to do. So, anyways, um, but I do have to say it's going to be a, it's going to be a bit of a it's going to be a bit sad, Sean, not having the kind of the the constant updates of what's happening at Pizza Boy <laughs> and the awesome stuff that they do out there. Yeah, well, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just <laughs> I am just happy to. Um, it's 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 it actually felt weird like uh putting my two weeks in and it's just been i'm actually like it's it's something like i've gotten serious about over the past like six months to a year uh i'm pr- pretty sure people can tell i'm getting a lot more serious and like trying to get a job and get hired with stuff and i was able to, you know fortunate enough to get a couple of things together um working through the end of the year and uh you know it's either you know i i'm pretty sure i won't be like not bartending for a while but like it's the type of thing where um it's good to just like start that chapter over and maybe uh do contract like like uh different types of contracting work over the next couple of years too uh do the different things within the uh, progressive community pretty cool so pretty cool. so you know so i guess uh i i, I mean you know I, our last call is going to have to change now Sean. We're gonna have to we're gonna have to ask about more a wider range of of beers from around the Harrisburg region uh, uh, to highlight for this year. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess uh, you know. Look, I've already eaten into your uh, into your uh, four twenty day. Uh, so, uh, do you have anything else for the good of the order? <laughs> I do not. Um, no, I don't. I, I I do not actually. All right. Any last words for those folks? Uh, well, I, I want to put out a call. This is one thing I'll say is I was, this is Sean's last weekend at Pizza Boy. So go see Sean. At, Three beers on me. Right. Go see Sean at Pizza Boy. Bring him gifts. Right. Um, like bring in like confetti if you can. Uh, streamers if you can. Anything to make the celebration that much brighter. Right. Out at the Pizza Boy. Owls of Hamden. Grab a slice of pizza. Grab a beer. And say congratulations, Sean, and like do dances for him, man. Right there in Pizza Boy, I want you to dance. I want you to sing. Whatever you can do, right? Just to make his last couple days that much more embarrassing. <laughs> as long as I get through tomorrow without killing anyone, I'll be fine. <laughs> there you go. Or there's that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. Well, uh, you know, one again, once again, seriously, on all seriousness, congratulations on kind of getting the gig with uh, Third and State and doing some great work there. Um, we're always going to plug it here, obviously, on on um, on our podcast and in our pages um, because it's great work. I um, mean, love the work that they do, anyways. The fact that you're writing for them now is huge. Um, and congratulations on moving on from Pizza Boy. Um, it's been a good ride. Thank you. All right. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging. Raging.